The atmosphere is electric. It sells out the Civic Center. The pace is flat out. The action is riveting. It's mid-March. It's the climax of the season. Some people call it the Minnesota State High School Hockey Tournament. We call it Minnesota Mania. Now, here is Channel 5 Sports Director, Bob Bruce. Minnesota Mania. You just know it's that time of year. You feel it. If the weather, which has threatened the Twin Cities, hasn't turned your thoughts to the St. Paul Civic Center, then maybe those hard-fought sectional finals of last week have. One thing is certain. As the 80s dawn on the state high school hockey tournament, there will be a new state champion. Edina East, the high school hockey story of the 70s, will not be back to defend last year's championship. And there are five new faces in the tournament this year. And that's to be expected, because as the old cliche goes, nothing is so certain as change. The ebb and flow of the dynasties and the upset champions throughout the history of the tournament continues. And it has been that change that has written a very rich and full tournament history. It began when hockey fans packed a smoke-filled St. Paul Auditorium, the site of the first ever state high school hockey tournament in 1945. The sport wasn't new, but the occasion was. No state had ever sponsored a sanctioned high school hockey tournament anywhere in the United States. In the tournament's early years, Eveleth, Minnesota established themselves as a high school hockey power by winning five of the tournament's first seven state championships. Their victory in 1951, their fourth in a row, coming as their last. Entering the 50s, schools like St. Paul Johnson, Thief River Falls, Roseau, and International Falls started to dominate play, all sharing time in the spotlight by winning a state championship. By early 1960, nearly 100 schools were playing this fast-growing sport, with each state tournament gaining the acclaim as the best ever. But not just the numbers of teams were on the rise, so were the numbers of fans. And by 1961, the tournament's three-day attendance figures had almost reached capacity at 42,000, with few seats left to be filled. By 1968, the tournament had outgrown its home of 23 years, and it was on to the more spacious Met Center in Bloomington, the home of the Minnesota North Stars. The tournament's first year at the Met accommodated 80,000 fans, who watched as Edina East won the first of five state titles beating War Road and Henry Boucher in the finals 4-3 in overtime. The 70s were filled with many great moments, like Joe Micheletti's eight goals and four assist performance, leading Hibbing in 1973 to only their second ever state championship. And International Falls winning their sixth championship by beating Grand Rapids in 1972. It was a state record. The Rapids caught tournament goers' eyes by winning back-to-back -back state championships in 1975 and again in 1976. The victory in 1976 was won under a new roof as the tournament returned back to St. Paul, having outgrown the Met to play in the St. Paul Civic Center. Then quite possibly the biggest upset in the history of the tournament, it came in 1977 when Rochester John Marshall completed a Cinderella story, playing in their first tournament unseated. They beat Edina East 4-2, showing the strength of hockey programs south of the Twin Cities. But the Hornets would bounce back, winning the title in 1978 and again in 79, with Mike Lowen scoring in overtime to avenge the 1977 John Marshall upset. Of one thing we're sure, feats like Mark Lowen's overtime goal to win the championship for Edina East last year will be repeated again this year in the 1980 tournament. Not necessarily in the form of an overtime tournament winner, but there will be high drama nonetheless because in the state tournament, it's bound to happen sometime, just as it happened over and over again in the final sectional games which brought this year's tournament field to St. Paul. We'll look at that in a moment when Minnesota Mania continues. We've taken a look into tournaments past, now for some recent history. Sectional finals were played last week to determine the eight teams in this year's state tournament. Let's look at how they got to St. Paul, beginning with tomorrow afternoon's first matchup, Minneapolis Southwest and South St. Paul. Rob Lear and Paul Hip report. Section 5's hockey championship is a flip of the coin proposition when Minneapolis Southwest and Washburn meet in the finals. Washburn was returning 14 players off last year's tournament team, 
while Southwest was looking to add to their string of 14 state tournament appearances. Washburn lost by identical 4-3 scores earlier this season to Southwest, so Washburn coach Pete Jockety knew his club was not far away from a return visit to St. Paul, and this rumored to be Jockety's final coaching season. From the start, the Minneapolis Conference champion Southwest took play early to Washburn. The time and time again, goaltender Dale Peterson turned the Indians aside. That is until Southwest Dan May's shot proved too hard to handle by Peterson, but dribbled across the goal line, and Southwest at 3.52 of the first period led 1-0. Washburn and their senior scoring star Rick Erdahl stormed back in the Southwest goal. The goalie Greg Dick made his first of several key saves in the first period. At the end of one period, Southwest led 1 0. The Washburn pressure carried over to the second period until the Millers finally tied the score at 1 on Dave Cowan's stuff shot. The Washburn victory celebration, though, would go short lived. Just over a minute later, Southwest magic man with the puck, Charlie Lundeen, scored a la Bobby Smith on a stuff shot of his own and gave the Indians a lead back at 2-1. Erdahl was not to be turned aside like he was again in the first period. He rattled the Millers back to a 2-2 tie and a nice passing play. Dave Meyer to Erdahl, Washburn had even the score. But Southwest hockey program has been successful over the years because of the big play. Southwest Terry Madsen made one of those for the Indians on the power play, scoring the game-winning goal at 4-18 and a blast from the point. Another look shows just how Matson's low drive combined with the traffic out front screened Peterson the goaltender's vision and the picture play execution that puts Southwest out in front to stay. On the other end of the ice, though, not without the help of some timely goaltending at Greg Dick, another product of Southwest coach Dave Peterson's goaltending school, a goalie himself, Peterson devotes hours of practice time working with his team's most important competitor. Dick has filled the bill, Peterson claims, as one of the best goalies he's ever coached. The game was finally put out of reach and a goal Washburn would just as soon forget. The Millers turned back on a close scoring play were putting heavy pressure on Southwest when Dave Love skated the puck out of his own zone and in an attempt to dump the puck scored on a blast from his own blue line in front of his players bench. And the countdown to the Civic Center had begun for the Southwest fans. You go in with nobody that has any tournament experience, what kind of problems is that going to propose for a young club? Well, it means that you go in with great enthusiasm and great excitement and you'll watch and see what happens. Uh, you're not really very sure. The first time you take a group to the tournament, anything can happen. You can be playing for the championship or your lab will be sitting out after two days, so you just have to go and see. You know that they're going to play with great enthusiasm. The thing that you try to get away from is uh, going in in awe of the, the whole spectacle because, as you well know, it's a big show. The characteristics of this hockey club, describe them for us. Well, I think that uh, we're a relatively young club with, uh, with good seniors, and I think we've gained a lot of poise the last half of the season. We're not taking the, uh, as many stupid penalties. Uh, we're playing with good poise whether we're ahead or whether we're behind, and uh, I think that we're, we're beginning to come of age. Uh, we really felt this was a rebuilding year. The victory for the Southwest Indians returns them back to the state tournament for the first time in two seasons. They'll open up play on Thursday afternoon in the opening round against the Section 4 opponent. We have more on that game. The South St. Paul Packers have a state tournament history dating back to 1947. With this appearance, it will be 20 times the Packers have been to the big one. A tournament participation history which included a string of six straight appearances from 57 to 62. The Packers now rank only back of Rozo's 21 appearances, but that's where the association stops. While Rozo boasts most tournament games won with 36, South St. Paul has the most tournament losses with 30. And the Packers also lay grudging claim to most tournament goals against. While Rozo has scored the most tournament goals with 198, South St. Paul has been letting in 176. But that may change this year if their Section 4 championship game shutout and scoring party is any indication. When the Packers took the ice at the St. Paul Auditorium last Friday night, they were determined to erase that 1 0 loss to Harding in last year's championship and return to the Civic Center side of the building where they'd been birthed in the state tournament in 77 and 78. And there was none of that goals against business. It was all goals for, seven of them against first-timer Como Park. The Packers pressured Park from the beginning and scored their first goal just two minutes, 33 seconds into the opening period. Phil Housley, the sophomore winger, deflected a centering pass in his own zone, picked it up again at mid-ice and zeroed a missile in on Como goalie Pat Coleman for a one-goal lead. That was the game winner but the scoring was six goals from being over. The pack continued to apply pressure and drove in payoff after payoff. Before the period ended, Phil's brother Larry Housley, a junior winger, upped the ante by one. Gary Mossolf at the blue line got the puck to Scott Dickemeyer, who shot from the crease and fouled up any chance for Coleman to recover. 
Larry Housley swooped around behind and came out on the left side and stuffed goal two into a yawning net. The onslaught continued in the second period when the Packers put things out of reach. First, Mossolf camped at the right side to put away goal three. Then senior winger Bill Zweig made another of those rink-long dashes, gave Como captain Tom Grobner the slip along the way, and scored unassisted for goal four. Goal five came when Scott Dickemeyer added impetus to Phil Housley's shot from the top of the slot. Goals six and seven in the third period had coach Doug Woog and his troops celebrating on the bench, knowing by then they'd be playing on the Civic Center side in another week. So that's the afternoon matchup. South St. Paul and Minneapolis Southwest, with the Packers hoping to build on their seven-goal shutout championship in Region 4 and erase some of those record book memories of tournaments past. Memories we asked Coach Doug Woog about. Does he ever think about those? I try not to. Uh, we had the same problem in soccer uh, this last year. Uh, we lost in the finals. The year before, we lost in the finals, and we just want to have a voice team win. And sometimes, uh, maybe it's the, the fluke is going to do it for us, but... We hope that we can crack that this year, and uh, it's been a long record of second and third places, and we hope we can get the first place trophy. In that trophy is a three-step process. Tomorrow, step one, when the Packers meet Southwest to open the tournament. This is Paul Hip. Now the second matchup of the tournament finds East Grand Forks running up against the unbeaten Hill Murray Pioneers. Both won their sectional championships last week. Here again with a look at the highlights are Rob Lear and Paul Hip. Section 8's high school hockey champion was to be decided here on neutral ground in Thief River Falls. The game matched Rozo, a three-time defending champion of this section, against a sectional tournament surprise, the Green Wave of East Grand Forks. In northern Minnesota, where hockey is considered king, fans here had packed the Thief River Falls ice arena two hours before game time. For betting man, Rozo's Rams were the logical choice here because Rozo has played in this title game so many times before. While East Grand Forks had already been tabbed the sectional Cinderella team that was considering themselves lucky just to be in the finals. Rozo, a small community that continues to feed the world on hockey talent, had another prospect that college scouts were telling us is one of the best players in the state of Minnesota. He's number eight, Mark Huglin, a strong, aggressive skater with a scoring net. But Huglin's efforts alone would not stop the enthusiasm of the Green Wave this night. Right from the start, East Side, showing no signs of any big game jitters, scored two first period goals. The first coming at 8.32 when senior defenseman Dave Jerome scored off a scramble out front. Rosso's cheering section took a deeper breath and their team's power play turned sour. Following to the aggressive and tenacious style of play, the Green Wave it resulted in a shorthanded goal. Tim Mishler passing the puck to his brother Tom, one of the East Side's leading scorer. And after one period of betting man's wallet, that started to feel lighter. East Grand Forks scoring was not worthy of capturing all the game's credit. The goaltender junior Mark Pagan was stopping Rozo on point-blank shots, frustrating Rozo's forwards all night. East Grand's scoring spree continued in the second period, when left wing Dave Gasperlin on a third chance put the puck into the net. And suddenly Rozo, a team that had been suffering from a season of lack of scoring, was faced with a long road ahead, trailing by three goals. Rozo mounted its comeback on the power play when Mark Huglin's shot from the point rebounded out to Billy Yan. Jan followed his own shot at the goal mouth going to the roof, finally beating Pagnet. Rozo's comeback was short-lived when East Grand Forks went up 4-1 in the third period. And suddenly the season-long dream to Tony Paul Messino to make another state tournament an adventure East Grand Forks had plotted only once in their school's history was looking like a reality. Rozo did manage to rally for two late third-period goals, but it was not enough as the Green Wave had fought off the odds, beating Rozo 4-3, returning to the spotlight of the high school hockey tournament. You're coming in as a tournament unknown. People don't know a lot about you. How is East Grand Forks going to fill that role? Well, we're just going to go hard. Like I say, we're not going to change our game plan. You know, these kids can handle pressure, though. We played in, I think, 10 one-goal games, and I think four of them, we 4-0 in overtime. So these kids have come through this year. We have a lot of seniors, a lot of leadership. So we're going to go in there, and we're going to give it our best. Is this a surprise for you? Do you think that you were going to be in the state tournament? Well, to be honest with you, Rob, when I saw it, when I... First day of practice, I knew we had the skating ability to, to win the Section 8. I honestly did. But then the way things were going, you know, we were on, on, on one night, off another night. I didn't know, but the last three weeks of the season, we really picked it up. And, yeah, so I thought we had a lot of confidence going into the Section 8 tournament. East Grand Forks' victory is considered only an upset because Rozo has won this section championship so many times before. The Green Wave, though, will move into St. Paul in the second game on Thursday afternoon against the state's number one ranked high school hockey team all year. For more on that, we shift sites now to St. Paul. By definition, other than religious, parochial means narrow, petty, provincial. 
Since the parochial schools were incorporated into the public school state hockey tournament, Hill Murray, by definition, has definitely been none of the above. The Pioneers have been in every state tournament since the private schools joined it. And they got in this year when they played their toughest game of the season, the Section 3 final, last Saturday night against White Bear Mariner. The man of the hour, at least of the 18 plus minutes of double overtime it took to decide that game, was junior centerman Dan Dolan. It was still fresh in his memory as tournament practice began early this week. Yeah, it was uh, pretty exciting. Uh, what happened was uh, Ben Belly brought it down the ice. He's his fourth year of this tournament. He's an old timer, so he kind of puts the puck where it's supposed to be at the right time. Anyway, Ben brought it in, threw it in the corner, and uh, Joy Horwath, my right winger, picked it up, threw it out in front, and I got one shot off, and the goalie saved it again. And uh, took another swap at it, and it went in. That was it. <laughs> The reason that overtime goal was so sweet for Dolan and the Pioneers was the battle that had taken place before it. Hill entered the game unbeaten. They had 24 wins, no losses. They were concerned about playing White Bear Mariner, but the feeling was more one of healthy respect than worry. Goaltender Jeff Crandall, they knew, would be troubled with his 1.5 goals against average. But they also knew they'd been ranked number one all year. They'd find a way. The way came rather more quickly than they might have expected. Less than two minutes into the game, Tom Xavier shot one way. Jim Murphy deflected it another, and the Pioneers were on their way, or so they thought. But all that did was inspire Crandall and company to tighten down the screws a bit tighter, and the reverse pressure paid off. The heat was on in the Hill Murray end when a Pioneer defender tried to play the puck, and it went to Jeff Larson out front. He rammed it in past goalie Jeff Poschel, and the game was tied at one. About four minutes later, at 13-11, there was a scramble in front of the Hill net. Mariner winger Charlie Basco won a battle for the puck along the left boards and sent it to the waiting stick of center Jeff Happy, camped about 15 feet out in the slot. Suddenly, it was two to one, Mariner. The second period started with White Bear threats, on which they later made good. Larson hit a pipe just 10 seconds into the period. Four minutes later, Steve Mueller slid the puck to sophomore defenseman Gary Keeger at the right point, and he rifled it home. Three goals against the number one ranked team in the state, the most anybody had scored against the Pioneers all year. Even coach Tom Simpson must have allowed himself the briefest of thoughts as he watched his team celebrate on the bench. Maybe this is the game that breaks the string. Hill caught a fresh breeze after that. Dan Dolan, the workhouse centerman who later would put the game away, shook the puck loose to Ben Beldy. They were short, fighting off King's elbowing penalty. Beldy fed Sean Regan at right point, and the Pioneers were halfway out of the jam, now trailing by one goal. It takes a certain amount of deception to beat a goalie the caliber of Crandall. It was Rob Schweitz sliding left to right and easing a backhander, middle of the third period, who saved the Pioneers from extinction. Then, tied at three, it became one of those frantically careful efforts to save your own goaltender grief while trying to issue some to the other. It ended that way, tied at three, till a checking adjustment allowed Hill to increase its pressure and gave Dan Dolan his moment. Nearly 19 minutes of playing time after the game had ended. You know, we were down three to one, and uh, I think a lot of people had doubts on whether we could pull it out or not, And because uh, Mariner was a good defensive club. They, uh, you know, they didn't take too many chances. They're a very smart hockey team, and uh, we had to work for everything to get the two goals to tie it up, and uh, came back and uh, tied it up in the third period, and then uh, hung on, uh, you know, and stayed with them the next, during the overtimes, uh, to pull it out, so it kind of showed me that we can still win the, the big game uh, and be able to come from behind. Hill Murray has had its disappointments in past tournaments, in spite of being in them all since they were included. But their unbeaten record this year, based on their team motto, all for one, one for all, will make them tough to beat. This is Paul Hill. Well, that's the afternoon bracket for tomorrow's opening round of the tournament. It should be a thriller. Now we'll be back to look at the evening matchups when Minnesota Mania continues. Tomorrow night's matchups in the opening round of the state hockey tournament promise just as much excitement as those in the afternoon. A couple of heavyweights, first timer Bloomington Jefferson and repeat entrant Irondale slug it out in the first game. We've got more and a look at the action from Rob Lear and Paul. <laughs> 
Geographically, there's no sensible explanation of the proximity of high schools in Section 2, so don't ask why the little Denfeld and the Twin Cities Irondales High School would play for the same sectional championships. When the two schools are 140 miles apart, but they did meet in the Duluth Arena, Denfeld's home ice. Irondale, a newcomer to the state tournament scene last season, when they came through to win the sectional, had Duluth Denfeld standing in their way for a return visit to St. Paul. Denfeld had won the right for the championship game, coming through on a dramatic three overtime victory over Duluth East, four to three in the semis. Tournament experience is one of those intangibles coaches refer to as a playoff edge. Irondale proved theirs, getting off to a fast start by scoring just 13 seconds after the opening faceoff. Mike Kelly doing his trick with a quick wrist shot. Then, just 12 seconds later, a quick-triggered Kelly would do his thing again before you could spell the Duluth Denfeld Hunters at 0-25 of the first period. An enthusiastic bunch of Irondale Knights had visions of a rerun. They blew out Duluth East last year in the sectional championship, 9-2. Goals would come easy all afternoon for Irondale. Then the work got easier when they could rely on their junior goaltender, John Olin. Olin, with a year of tournament experience under his chest protector, turned back Denfield most of the first period. But the hometown fans finally had something to stand and cheer about when their senior, Keith Raleigh, beat the netminder on this play, his first of three goals on the afternoon. Irondale was forced to play Denfeld's physical and at times chippy style of play this day because officials refused to call a tight contest. And because of it, one Irondale player was taken to the hospital for a possible concussion, another with a fractured wrist. Coach Dave Manley still does not know if his squad will be in full strength when they open play tomorrow. Irondale has earned its instant credibility with power on its scoring. Irondale's power play is a force to be reckoned with. Manley is one of those coaches that believes in complete team effort, and that's what he's got with his club riding a 13-game winning streak. Irondale has not lost a high school hockey game since January 19th. And what time in the team are you going to bring into the St. Paul Civic Center? Well, I think we're a balanced team. We got three units. I got. Uh, I'm so proud of these kids. We got every kid playing. Every kid on the team except the spare goalie, and uh, it just wasn't the kind of game I'd get them in. Uh, it's too it's too hectic here tonight. But uh, everybody's playing. That that you know makes everybody a big part of the machine, and uh, I think that helps us. You got one year of tournament experience under your belt. Yeah, it's that helps. <laughs> in a game like this, it helps. I'll tell you. You're going to open up that Thursday evening session against Bloomington Jefferson. What do you know about the Jaguars? Well, they're a good team. I went out and looked at them the other night, and uh, they pass the puck really well. They seem to have depth. Uh, you know, we know we're going to have a tough game in every game in the state tournament. Uh, a lot of those teams are really good. What do you expect from Bloomington? Well, I just expect a game uh, where the team that hustles the most is going to win it. I, uh, I think we're as good as they are, uh, you know, looking at them. Of course, I've only seen them once, and uh, they've got a lot of notoriety this year, so I'm sure they're just super, but uh, we play pretty good hockey when we're playing our game, I think. So the Irondale Knights return to the State High School Hockey Tournament, and they'll open play in the evening session's very first game against the newest member of the State High School Hockey Tournament fraternity, the Bloomington Jefferson Jaguars. For more on that, we switch sites now to the Met in Bloomington. The set two for the Section 1 championship last Saturday afternoon at Met Center had a new look about it. The Southern Power Rochester Mail was a first-timer bidding for a state tournament spot. And so was powerful Bloomington Jefferson, one of the four tournament entrants this season who were to reach the 20-win plateau. Mayo wanted to keep the Section 1 title in Rochester. John Marshall won it last year and reached the state final. Jefferson wanted to join Kennedy and Lincoln as the last Bloomington High School to enter. An interesting game. All of the goals scored shorthanded or on power plays. And it was Jefferson's Rob Ono who bit first. Bloomington on the power play with winger Matt Gilbertson working the corner. He dropped the puck back of the right side to Ono, who came out and stuffed it between Scott Hines' pads. It was only the second goal of the first period, but it set the stage for power plays. And it was the Mayo brother combination, Jim and John Johansson, who scored for Rochester. Jim down the right side and moving fast behind the net, then out front and firing at Jefferson's John Colombo. Brother Jim sprawled in front, got a stick on it to deflect it in and tie things at one. But a tripping call left Mayo a man short, and Jefferson broke back with the first of two unanswered power play goals. The first at 4.29 of the second period when Jim Becker's shot from the slot went in close and falling Dan Beatty slammed it home. The second of those power play goals, four minutes later, came when Jay North got the puck to Tom Curvers and he put it away for a 3-1 Jefferson lead. Then in the last minute of the second period came what may have been the finest individual performance in a sectional game this year. 
Jefferson down a man. Matt Gilbertson in the box for hooking. Jay North forechecking for his shorthanded Jaguars. Nabbed the puck from Jim Johansson, stormed in, and scored. Unassisted. Then, same penalty in effect, same shift. 17 seconds later, North got the puck again. Fired again, scored again. Shorthanded, unassisted. Two shorthanded, unassisted goals during the same penalty. On the same shift, 17 seconds apart. That's got to be some kind of record. Jim Johansson redeemed some of that with a goal in the third period. So it ended 5-2 for Jefferson and the ecstatic Jags' first trip to the state tournament. Enthusiastic as they were about their success, nobody was more so than their coach, Tom Soderdahl. These guys, they're so classy on and off the ice. We've got five kids on National Honor Society. The other five seniors are way up there in their class rank. And these kids, hey, they won't quit. And they're just classy kids on and off the ice. And they showed it today. I think in this game, there was, there was some examples of that. You know, you're leading 5-1 after two periods. They could have let down. They forechecked as well as they did in the first period. Yeah, we missed a few, too. We had a two-on-one in the first First, about the first 40 seconds or so, I thought that Robbie Ono would get that one in, but he missed it. But I will forgive him this time. No, they wouldn't quit. They're not going to quit now. It should be a slugfest, a battle of heavyweights. Tomorrow night's first evening game, Irondale and Bloomington Jefferson. This is Paul Hill. The final game in the first round action tomorrow has Hopkins Lindbergh taking on six-time Section 7 champion Grand Rapids. They are tough. Here's a look at how they made it to the tournament. Edina East has earned Section 6 a reputation by winning five state championships in the 35-year history of the hockey tournament. All five state titles have been won since 1969, including back-to-back -back championships in 1978 and 79. But winning a third in a row is out of the question. The Hornets were knocked out of sectional play this year by a backyard rival, Edina West, losing in the semifinals 4-3 in overtime. West's emotional victory ended years of postseason frustration for West coach Bart Larson, advancing his Cougars into the sectional finals up against Hopkins Lindbergh. Lindbergh, the Lake Conference North champion, had earned its way into the finals with victories over Mound and Armstrong, in the process of building on a current six-game winning streak. Lindbergh and Edina West had met only once previously this season, playing in a two-period shortened preview, so both clubs knew very little about each other, other than both boasted the play of their goaltenders. West senior netminder Pat Tierney would prove to be tough to beat. His superb play through the sectional was enough to put West in this title game. But taking no back seat was Lindbergh's senior netminder Duffy Loney. Loney, a two-time all-conference selection, makes a habit of stopping rubber. The goaltending battle was established early, with both teams denied good scoring chances. Then Lindbergh would break the ice, scoring when Todd Bjorkstrad's decoy play forced two defensemen to make a move, and he slipped the puck to winger Mark Sawinski, who put it away, and the Lindbergh Flyers were on the board. West then rallied back to tie the score at one in the second period when John DeVore's shot from a bad angle eluded Looney and Edina West had visions of playing in their first ever state high school hockey tournament. The game was still tied at one well into the third period when Lindbergh's captain Bill Snuggerud went off for elbowing. West power play would then be put to the test. Applying pressure in the Lindbergh zone, West moved the puck back to the point where Bjorkstrand, the Flyers' leading scorer, blocked the shot and he was on his way. Showing no signs of hesitation, Bjorkstrand beat the goalie to send Lindbergh fans flying. Edina West tried to gain the equalizer by pulling their goaltender with a minute and five seconds left to go in the game. But Looney, like he had done all year, made the big stop when they were needed. And Lindbergh added an open net goal to make the final score three to one. To send the Lindbergh Flyers back to the state high school hockey tournament for their second appearance, their first since 1975. It was just a tremendous feeling. We were so happy about this whole game. We played one of the best teams in the state, and we were real successful. Edina West is one of the finest teams we've ever played, and we were really happy to win the game. Dave, what kinds of things have brought you here? I guess just a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication, and a tremendous amount of improvement on our players. They really worked hard. They worked together, and they wanted this a lot. We were fortunate enough to get it. Get it means the evening bracket and a date with Section 7 power Grand Rapids in the final game of the day's opening session. For more on Lindbergh's foe, we travel north to Hibby. The Halloween machine is howling again, and seven is its lucky number. Grand Rapids has won the Section 7 championship to advance to the state tournament for the seventh straight time. Cheerleaders who perform with ceremonial headdresses all year will dust them off for another trip to St. Paul. The orange and black are back. The occasion of this year's Section 7 title game was in Hibby. The combatants, Grand Rapids, and International Falls, coached by the venerable Larry Ross. 
Ross has had 13 state tournament teams, and he knows how to start a club fast, get them moving quickly toward a regional championship. At Hibbing last Thursday, it took just a minute 48 seconds. Fall senior captain Pete Lucas stole the puck at center ice, shot, and was semi-stopped by Rapids' John Casey. But Fall's Jeff Burns was there to follow up, and the Broncos had a one-goal lead. And they held it for a period and a half. But injuries had riddled the Falls roster, and without fresh troops, they began to fade. Rapids cracked goalie Jade Wagner for the first time when Dave Casey fed Bob Madsen from the side of the net to tie it up. Then, awesome is the way to describe the power play goal just over two minutes later. Madsen back of the Falls net to the right, waiting, waiting. Then Tom Rothstein took one step up the slot, the perfect pass, and a goal for the Rapids captain. Less than a minute after that, at full strength, Rapids' Sean Edwards broke hard up the left side. The puck went to Jim Malwitz, who refed Edwards with a behind-the-back pass as Edwards cut through the slot. And falling, slipped it underneath Wagner with less than 30 seconds left in the second period. Rapids then had a 3-1 lead. Grand Rapids had Jim Rothstein, then John, then Bill, and now Tom Rothstein. Tom is the senior captain of this edition of the Halloweeners. He put away the final goal of the Section 7 championship game at 1.39 of the third period. From there, they skated it out. A 4-1 win and a seventh straight trip to state. This trip was engineered by first-year coach Rod Christensen, who's glad to continue a winning tradition. It means a lot to me and, and to a lot of our seniors, really. You know, each year, you know, you have to prove yourself uh, time and time again. And, and it was, wasn't any different this year. You know, there's always a the doubt that the fans have, you know. But uh, we're, we're awfully proud to be representing Region 7 again. That's tomorrow night's final matchup. Seven-time veteran Grand Rapids against the newcomer, Hopkins Lindbergh. For Rob Lear, this is Paul Hip, Channel 5 Sports. So that's the story. Eight talented high school hockey teams who will battle over the next three days to determine who's to become the 1980 state tournament champion. The state tournament has produced some phenomenal individual stories, and people who have participated in the tournament have gone on to great success. More on that when Minnesota Mania comes back. This fascination with hockey, this thing we call Minnesota mania, begins as early as a youngster gets a look at anyone fooling around with a puck and a stick. And those childhood dreams can lead to some mighty big realities, playing in the state tournament and beyond. We'll give you just one example. Do you recognize this little kid? He played in the youth programs on the east side of St. Paul. His dad was a coach. Need more clues? His Johnson High School team will celebrate with a reunion during this weekend's tournament, a team which was part of that powerful Johnson of 1952 through 1957, when they appeared in the state tournament in each of those years. In all, they had been to the tournament 19 times. Or maybe this will help you. He played on virtually every United States national team from 1961 through 1970, and was on the Olympic teams in 1964 and 68. He was the last man cut from the Olympic gold medal team of 1960. Herb Brooks, as a player, has come a long way from the outdoor rinks in the state tournament auditorium ice of St. Paul. When Brooks started coaching at the University of Minnesota seven seasons ago, he began to collect so much powerful talent that the Gophers, whose gold of the early years had tarnished a bit, began to shine like a bright new penny. His approach was as a taskmaster. He insisted his players must throw their hearts out on the ice if they wanted to succeed. You don't want people leaving their checks so the puck is hit, you know, to the open man. All of a sudden, you're going to have to start recovering. Let's not everybody get, you know, caught up, you know, running out of a bunch of air. A lot of you people are really on the threshold of joining a very select fraternity, a fraternity of ex-Minnesota hockey players, someone that's going to wear that M. And there's nothing in your life that you'll find more proud, gentlemen. Let's get ready to go. Come on. Well, go they did. The Gophers began to flirt with national championships. In the first six years of Herbie's tenure, they won the NCAA championship twice and finished second once. Then last year, Brooks began to make statements that sounded like the Gophers were predestined to be the national champions again. There's absolutely no question in my mind that this team has the talent that they can win it all. And win it all they did. A third national championship. It was then the United States Olympic Committee began shopping for a coach for the Winter Games. And when they interviewed Brooks for the job, they asked him what his goals were. With the typical east side emphasis, he shot back, 
to win the whole damn thing, to win the gold medal. Then the grind began, a 60-game exhibition schedule against other Olympic teams, lots of minor league pro clubs, and even unprecedented matches with National Hockey League teams. And as he watched his team develop, Brooks softened his estimate of its ability to simply skate into Lake Placid, grab off the gold medal, and go home. Well, we're in the toughest bracket. We got the Swedes first, the Czechs, uh, you know, second. We got to upset one of those two. And then the West Germans got one heck of a team. So we've got three real, three real tough, tough games. Uh, the Swedes will be an excellent team. You know, they can skate, handle all the teams there. People don't realize the quality of that opposition. We've been a real good minor professional hockey club all year. But now this is, you know, real high echelon competition. Uh, you know, we're the underdogs. And we got to upset somebody. But we're going to go in there. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're not going to be open. Up so uptight we can't execute. It's been a life uh, dream come true for these athletes, and I'm sure not going to screw it up by getting them up, so, uh, you know, so uptight. So once we get there, we're just going to let it all hang out and see if we got enough to, to get it done. Lake Placid finally arrived, and Brooks knew he was in trouble when he had to pull his goalie, trailing Sweden, but then success. Now Harrington goes out, Pavlich comes in, slap shot by Ramsey, is blocked in front. Baker, number six, to Schneider. Buzz, back of the net, fighting for control of the puck with 29 seconds to play. Baker on it, Oh, Baker with 27 seconds remaining in the game, and look at that scene on the ice. The Americans tie the Swedes. Baker from out in front, beating Lindbergh to tie it 2-2. Two days later, Buzzy Snyder scored two goals, and the second team, Brooks, said they had to upset the Czechs had been waxed 7-3. Then they had a fairly easy time with Norway winning 5-1. They ran slim, talented Romania out of the building with a 7-2 run. They were already in the medal round when they played West Germany. Then, incredibly, against the Russians, Mark Johnson ended the first period of the game by tying it up with a second effort goal at 2-2. I don't know. It, uh, the game against the Czechs was a, was a coach's dream. Tonight, uh, we bettered it. I, I can't believe it. Uh, you know, our, we had a we had a game plan. Uh, the players uh, stayed with it. We made a change uh, uh, real early in the first period. Uh, uh, that Lou Vero and Craig Patrick and myself talked about a tactical way to prevent them from pinching. I thought we walked out, and I thought we got stronger as the game went on. And I told him, going to go into third period, this is our best period. Uh, statistically, we've always outconditioned people, and I couldn't believe it. We were skating with the Russians, and you know, I, was, I wasn't numb by any means. And I was thinking now, don't let these guys come unglued. Don't let them. We had to stay with it, what got us there. Then the gold medal game with Finland. They threw Phil Vercoat in the penalty box. But that just gave inspiration to Mark Johnson, and he put the smile back on the coach's face. Center right. Morrow has it. 1.33 left in the penalty. Kristoff and Broughton doing a great job of forechecking, and Kristoff's shot went off the pole. Kristoff scrapping for it again. Gets it out in front of the Americans' control, keeping it in. Johnson skating in the shot. But we can be score! I think we broke some stereotypes early in the year, and some people said we got a bunch of figure skaters, but I've always felt that a North American athlete is just as good as the Europeans. I thought some of the tactics had to be given to them to bring it out, and they were not non-believers by any means. They liked it, but we struggled. We didn't have the timing. We couldn't read those little keys. Uh, but as time went on, they got a little bit into it. Uh, but I didn't want to have them revert under pressure and, and dump and run. And, and we try to stay with it, stay with it. And it's tough. It's like holding onto a racehorse. Uh, but you really have to give the credit to the athletes. Uh, 
hey, you know, I work for people at the university and I work for people here in the Olympic Committee and they're all great people to work for, but your athletes are your assets and we just got a great group of kids. The gold medal, the first in 20 years. It was one of those rare occurrences which really can't be put into perspective at that moment or even now. Herb Brooks, a story that started on the playgrounds in the Johnson High neighborhood through the state tournament, the University of Minnesota, to the top of the international hockey world at Lake Placid. And we at Channel 5 are proud to say that Herb Brooks, Herbie if you will, will join our broadcast team for live coverage of the 1980 State High School Hockey Tournament. We're delighted to say welcome aboard, Herbie. Minnesota mania is a fad that begins for all the 150 high schools in the state that play hockey back in October. That's when coaches have their players report to that first day of practice. Since then, it's been a long season for all these teams, having to overcome some of the adversities of a 25-game schedule, like injuries and illnesses. But that's all behind the eight tournament teams now. It's full speed ahead, all just three victories away from the state championship. For the players and coaches, it all begins tomorrow. But for those supporting characters, behind the scenes, their tournament preparations began early this week. The hardest seat in the state to come up with every year at this time is a ticket to see the state high school hockey tournament. Over 12,000 season tickets are sold, leaving the rest to the eight respected high schools in the tournament. Students started lining up early Tuesday morning at their schools in hopes of being able to purchase the prized item worth its weight in gold, a ticket for the session their school would be playing in. In the meantime, plans were being made for the eight bands and hundreds of cheerleaders and dance line participants who would be at the tournament. One of the final preparations for the students themselves is usually to give their team a pep fest. Bloomington Jefferson gave their hockey team a send-off message of good luck. The noise level was about the same when the printing presses started rolling in St. Paul. This year's state high school hockey tournament program includes a color shot from last year's state championship game between Edina East and Rochester John Marshall. By the time these presses stop late tonight, 12,000 programs selling for a dollar apiece will be ready to be packed in boxes and delivered to the Civic Center. Meanwhile at the arena, the concessionaires are busy checking inventory making sure their supplies will be adequate enough to feed some 100,000 fans that are expected to show up at this year's tournament. But before the doors can be opened, Civic Center building manager John Friedman has to check over his master preparation list. Well prepared, we, we do a lot of planning with the State High School League and go over a uh, number of uh, issues, uh, items with the fire, police, Red Cross personnel, State Highway, but patrol, the telephone companies, the bus companies. We, uh, the high school league, uh, are in our very concern, uh, and rightly so, with the safety of the fans and the spectators. And this is our, our primary uh, uh, object is to uh, make sure that everything is safe and the buildings is clean and we're ready to go. We, you know, this is uh, our fourth year now with the state high school hockey tournament. And uh, we're, uh, we've worked out all the bugs, I think except uh, more seats. It looks like the only people who won't worry about seats at this year's tournament are the players. The final session has been sold out. Tomorrow is sold out. So is Friday night. Only a few standing room and consolation bracket tickets remain for the 1980 tournament. During the tournament, it said there's always a party going on somewhere in St. Paul. Well, right now, there's a party in St. Paul. That's the Park Center Jazz Ensemble at the St. Paul Radisson tonight to entertain the 645 people there in the Grand Ballroom. 
Now they're there to honor the eight tournament teams who will begin competition tomorrow to see who's going to end up with that number one championship trophy Saturday night. Now among those 600 plus, of course, were the players from the teams who will be competing for that trophy, and so were the coaches, their parents, and school officials and friends who want to wish them well as the 1980 state tournament begins. It's the annual send-off banquet, the time when athletes can get together for the first time to make acquaintances on a more friendly basis before tomorrow's serious business. Because it will be tomorrow that those players will get together. Only this time they won't be in suits and ties. They'll be in battle dress. They'll be padded and masked and they will be ready to go. So let's take one more look, a review of tomorrow's pairings in the tournament. Representing Section 5 are the Minneapolis Southwest Indians. The Minneapolis Conference champions make this trip their 15th state tournament appearance, their first since 1977. Southwest, after a 20-4 season record, open play tomorrow afternoon with Section 4 champion South St. Paul. The Packers, in this their 19th state tournament, take a certain home ice advantage into play after sporting the most successful 18-4-1 season. The second game of the afternoon session highlights tournament favorite Hill Murray, the Section 3 champ. The experienced pioneers make this six in a row, coming in as the only unbeaten team in the eight school field with a 25-0 record. The pioneers foe another green and white combination, the green wave of East Grand Forks. Coming in as the smallest school in the tournament, East Side thinks big with no jersey number less than number 10. The evening session starts with the Twin Cities Classic. Bloomington Jefferson making their first tournament appearance ever enjoyed a season of great success in Section 1 with a winning record of 21 and 2. The Jaguars opponent, Irondale, was last year's tournament newcomer with eight sophomores. Those sophomores are now juniors, and coach Dave Manley has his Knights flying in with a 21 and 4 record. Saving the best for last. That's a good way to describe Section 7 champion Grand Rapids. They always seem to be there when they're playing for the championship. This will be their seventh trip in a row to St. Paul. The Halloween machine is rolling. They're paired up against the Hopkins Lindbergh Flyers, the Lake North Conference champion. Lindbergh making the school's second tournament appearance, their first since 1975, come in with a record of 17 and six. There you have it. The teams are ready. The Civic Center is ready, and we are ready here at KSTP to bring you the excitement and color of the 1980 State High School Hockey Tournament. This is our second year in a row to bring you the tournament, and it will be with the most comprehensive group of people and collection of television equipment really ever assembled by this station. Our technical people, they started to set up all the equipment on the remote site in St. Paul early Monday morning. They got together and they took the caravan of all of the mobile units that we'll be using throughout the three days over at the Civic Center in anticipation of a, another really thrilling three days. Last year we covered the action with seven cameras. Well, this year we've decided to have nine so that we can get you closer to the action. There'll be dozens of microphones, banks of tape recorders, projectors, and of course Al Shaver will be there with uh, Bob Utech, Let's Play Hockey, Howard Cosell won't be with us this year, but we'll have someone else, a very special someone. Herb Brooks will be with us this year, and he'll provide insight and in-depth analysis between periods and before the games so we can find out what we can expect in the upcoming period or in the upcoming game. Ed Cairo, as always, will be downstairs to interview the many celebrities and friends of the hockey tournament who stopped by. And Rob Lear, last year this was one of our, really a fun part of the tournament, our roving camera. He'll be everywhere in the Civic Center, from the roof to the basement to on top of the Zamboni, as you saw just a moment ago. What we're really trying to say is that we're ready to do it. It's a cast of 65 people will be at the Civic Center, ready to bring you what promises to be another great high school hockey tournament in a long line of high school hockey tournaments. I know speaking for myself, this is really the most exciting time of the year for me because I think the high school hockey tournament in Minnesota is probably the premier amateur athletic event in the United States. And there's another thing that makes it special. ABC, well, they just finished the Winter Olympics. Well, for us here at KSTP, a high school hockey tournament is sort of like our own Special Olympics because you'll see that same honest enthusiasm that you saw when the United States Olympic hockey team won the gold medal at Lake Placid. 
It all starts tomorrow. I'll be there for the, well, over 22 and a half hours of hockey coverage over the next three days. I hope you can join us. It begins tomorrow at 12 o'clock with a pregame show, then it's into the afternoon session. So be with us as we bring you the 1980 High School Hockey Tournament. That's the 1980 edition of Minnesota Mania. Join us tomorrow at noon for the opening round of the 1980 State High School Hockey Tournament. Al Shaver, Bob Bruce, Bob Utek, Rob Lear, Ed Caro, and U.S. gold medal Olympic coach Herb Brooks report from the Civic Center live on Channel 5.